Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Okay, today is going to be a fun one. It's more how the body works. And, and if you look at it, you, you might think, gosh, our species is so defective particularly when we're looking at, at autoimmune diseases. So what, what is that? What is, what's the official word on autoimmune diseases? That the body is attacking itself. Or what about dementia? We just don't know. So let's find out about this stuff. Well, according to, and this was published online 2014. So that was five years ago. Okay. And it was an update of one that was published in 2012. Now I'm bringing this up because this is, again, it's on PubMed and you know, the uh, previous chronic disease journal, half of the U.S. population, now this was five years ago, half has one or more chronic illnesses or disease. And they also say that one in four, 25%, have multiple chronic diseases. Now that's bad. Now they're talking, and again, this was five years ago, a 30-fold increase in autism. So obviously our species is defective or there's something wrong. So let's go now to 2019 to the CDC. Oh, oh, what was that? Yes, you just heard angels sing. When I say the CDC, you just think, man, we have God, the Bible, and the CDC. Okay, because they can't make a mistake. Okay, because we're depending on them for so many things. But they're saying, since they're in charge of the health of the world, okay, six out of 10. So now it's 60%. It went from 50% five years ago. Now it's 60% of our population is a chronic illness or disease. In five years, that's not good. Okay, and it also says 40%, not 25%, have multiple chronic illnesses or diseases. It's also 54% of our kids. Now, when you look at this, and we'll just go over heart disease, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, stroke, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, or kidney diseases, the thing that 60% of our population has, what's the cause of it? Either lifestyle factors are unknown. Okay, I have a car with a noise and it's smoking. I bring it to the mechanic and he says, gee, doc, I have no idea what's wrong with it, but I have a shitload of therapies for it. <laughs> no, I don't think it'll last longer, but it'll be more comfortable and it'll smoke less. Okay, would you find another mechanic or stick with that one? Okay, yeah, so, so obviously this is crazy. I mean, when we look at Zantac, okay, this is, it just pulled off the shelves last week, okay, and this is, has a, a molecule in there that can cause cancer, but it's not just in the antacid. And you could say, well, gee, don't, don't antacids, don't those increase esophageal cancers? Yes, they do. Okay, don't they decrease mental absorption that can cause cardiac arrhythmias? Absolutely they do. Okay, don't they increase um, gastrointestinal problems? Absolutely they do. But it allows you to eat poisonous food. So this way you can go to the fast food restaurant that has the genetically modified high fructose corn syrup and the, the special oils that actually damage your intestinal tract and you consume them with less discomfort. <laughs> Dude, this is 2019. Honest to God, you know this is gonna be like a Saturday Night Live episode in another 100 years. Okay, the fundamental problem is that it's an unstable molecule. The drug itself can directly degrade and form a highly, highly efficient um, cancer-causing agent. So, an unstable molecule. Now, this is a drug that went through all the FDA, the Fraud and Deception Association approval process, that takes years. Okay, and <laughs> don't worry about vaccines, they didn't have to do that. So let's look at how the body actually works. And we're going to run through a rough overview because we've already done hundreds of talks on digestive tract, this, but I just want you to get like a rough overview that your body is smart. Okay, so let's talk about the automatic nervous system or autonomic. It's in two parts. Okay, one part keeps you alive under stress. That's called the sympathetics. The other part regenerates tissue. That's the parasympathetics. Now, the sympathetics is located in the middle of the back or the rib cage and top of the lumbar. The parasympathetics is located in the pelvis and the upper neck area. So you might think, gee, if we had a trauma in the mid-back, upper back, low back pelvis, that that might negatively affect the, the autonomic nervous system. And you'd be right. Now, what's interesting, um, 
like I, I'll do a report. I just had a report today, and this person was taking two blood pressure medications. And so I said, um, well, luckily you don't have high blood pressure. You have a stress state. And they said, no, I do have high blood pressure. And I said, I said, okay, now, God, I got to think, still think of this. So I'm in a room. This person is in a delusional state. They actually think that high blood pressure exists, okay? And they're taking two drugs for it that's causing erectile dysfunction, anxiety, stress, and depression because it says it on the labels, but they're still taking it because the doctor said, you have to take it. Your blood pressure has to be this. And, and so, so I got to go in there and I say, look, you don't really have it. So I came up with an idea and I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to stand on your foot while I'm checking your blood pressure. Will it be high or low? You know what they said? Gee, doc, it'll probably be higher. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to wear spiked high heels and stand on your foot. Will that raise your blood pressure? And they said, yes, it will. Thank you, God. Okay, so do you really have high blood pressure or do you have a doctor standing on your toe? <laughs> and they said, they said, well, I guess you're right, doc. It's somebody putting me in a stressed state. And I said, cool. Yeah, so that's what we found. So when you look at this, when you're under stress, the immune system is metabolically expensive, so that's suppressed. Digestion is metabolically expensive. Like when you have a big meal, you say, damn, let's go play racquetball. No, it's unbutton the belt and watch a movie. Okay, so, so you look at this. And, and so, so when you're in that stress state, blood supply to the gut shut down. So you're talking slow gastric motility, one bowel movement a day. Um, if you're in a stress state, you're going to need appropriate stress hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. So cholesterol levels have to go up. If you're in a stress state, the liver is going to start to break glycogen down to glucose, so blood sugar goes up. So you start to think, wait a second. So does that mean that high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, okay, could be stress responses? Absolutely they could be. So we got to find a way to check them. What we do is we'll use a heart rate variability. Now this was developed back in the 60s by the Russians, the Americans and Brits found the technology during the Cold War. <laughs> okay, the five people in here who remember the Cold War, <laughs> we weren't really sharing information. Okay, so you look at this, and this is the sympathetic and parasympathetic chart. Now, here's an 83-year-old gal, numbness in her hands. Do you think it's a hand problem or a problem in the neck leading to the hands? Okay. Uh, anxiety. So, if you have your 83 and your hands don't work, do you think that you'll be happy about that or have anxiety? Absolutely. But also, if you've been in a chronically stressed state, you've got decreased blood supply and nerve supply to the gut. This is where serotonin is produced. This is where neurotransmitters for the brain are produced. So in a chronic sympathetic dominant state, you're going to have altered gut function. Yes or yes. Okay. So then she also has fatigue. Why? She's in a chronic sympathetic dominant state. How do you think her sleep patterns are? Horrible. Okay. And she was misdiagnosed with high blood pressure. So how about we look for the cause? Does that make more sense? So the nervous system, the central nervous system, is completely housed in bone, the brain and spinal cord. And so if there's any trauma here, obviously the brain isn't going to communicate correctly to the body and the body will have alterations in communication. This is why we look at the spine. And so people come in and say, you really think it's related to the spine, my high blood pressure? I, say, I don't know. I'm going to take a picture. But if I see loss of curb, degeneration, forward head carriage, abnormality, unstable <laughs> pelvis, yeah. If this is what you look like, I'm going to say, yes, I think that's a contributing factor, you nimble. Okay, so, so, but also, too, we can check each part of this. So, like, if you look at the cross section of the spinal cord, the front portion is where light touch is. Okay, the back half is where vibration is. The side of the spinal cord is where temperature is. So, we use a vibration tuning fork to identify if, if the front portion of the cords damage the side or the back half. So it's really cool because if you get somebody with a spinal cord injury and you're tracking him and you all of a sudden see that vibration is starting to return, you can say, look, man, you're going to get some function back because your spinal cord's still intact. Now say it with me. Wow, that's cool. I know because it's all stuff in it, but this is, this is why if you knew how your body works, you wouldn't put crap in it. Okay, 45-year-old. High blood pressure. Did she have high blood pressure or a stress state? Stress state. 
100% of the time because there's nothing broken when somebody has high blood pressure. So it's foolish to give a high blood pressure drug unless you're looking at the physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Does that make sense? Okay, so then type 2 diabetes. Now, knowing that type 2 diabetes is a blood poisoning, that if you alter your physical, chemical, emotional stress, you change your diet, okay, within a week, blood sugar starts to normalize. Within 30 to 60 days, it goes away. Check out the video, um, Simply Raw by Dr. Gabriel Cousins. It just makes sense. Now, thyroid. Just like we have a balance to the autonomic nervous system, we have a balance between the adrenals and the thyroid. When the adrenals are up, the thyroid's down. When the thyroid's up, the adrenals are down. So in a chronically stressed state, what are we misdiagnosed with? Thyroid issues, adrenal fatigue, all of that stuff. And that's not really possible, okay, unless someone's in a chronic stress state. See, doctors are looking downstream. They're seeing the thyroid, they're seeing the blood pressure, they're seeing the cholesterol and the blood sugar, but they don't have time or understanding to look at this. So what happens if you give a drug to lower blood pressure? Well, according to the University of Alabama, um, your risk of stroke went up by about a third for each blood pressure taken. Do you want to know why? Because they actually work. They lower blood pressure. Okay, but now wait a second. Let's think about this. So the blood pressure, your blood pressure goes up and down depending on need. Okay. So let's say that I'm adjusting, you know, probably 30, 40 people before seven o'clock this morning. I've had two cups of coffee and I'm pretty excited because I've got a, a bunch of stuff to do today. Okay. My blood pressure is probably up here. What is this number? I don't know. It just happens to be self-regulating. So now let's say I take a chemical to alter my physiology to lower it. Where did my body want it? Back up here. So what the body does, you've got arteries that constrict. So if the blood pressure goes too low, the arteries constrict to elevate it. So think of putting your thumb over the hose, okay, to, to increase the pressure. So that's what happens. So you take a drug, the arteries constrict. Let's say you've had a crappy lifestyle. So the arteries are damaged. They constrict to elevate it, but you've got um, atherosclerotic placking because of excessive toxic exposure. The arteries aren't healthy and they constrict, then you can limit blood flow. This is why strokes increase. You're in as much trouble by the time you're on three blood pressure medications that achieve excellent control as when your hypertension is untreated. We want to raise the issue that despite great advances in pharmaceutical approach, relying solely on this approach has become at a dear price of people's lives. Yes, Hippocrates was right. Don't screw it up. Look for the cause. Now, here's, here's I mean, obviously, this is a person standing up straight. And you can look at the chart next to them, knowing that the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart is in the top of the rib cage area. That's called T1 through T4. That's the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart. Do you think they might have cardiac arrhythmias, abnormal blood pressure, or something? Yeah. Well, they were, had um, two high blood pressure medications, a thyroid, an antacid, and one for pain. Now, any, does anybody in here know what happens when you mix... Um, a beta blocker, a diuretic, an antacid, and a pain reliever. God, I was hoping someone would, because I don't. You know, there's no study out there. So, you know, what you, when you have friends like this, give them advice like your mom would give you. Honey, we don't know what happens when these drugs are mixed together, so separate them. Okay, how much? I don't know. Try an hour. Doc, there's not enough hours in the day. Okay, half an hour. Drink water in between. You're going to lessen the poisoning effects of this. Okay, does that make sense? So just, just know that this is not based in science. There's no study out there that says two blood pressure drugs and an antacid and a pain reliever are good for you. Forget the thyroid. Okay, so, so what we do is we don't treat diseases. We look at the physical, chemical, and emotional stress load. So this is before, this is after. Let me do that again. Before, you'll see a slightly worse uh, deviation. After, we're seeing the more appropriate biomechanics. Consequently, their blood pressure normalized. Okay, they never had a thyroid issue in the first place because when you're in a stress state, the adrenal glands are going to fire off and the thyroid's going to appear low. Okay, so, and the pain, you know, was reduced and it, was, it wasn't eliminated. But do you want to give a non steroidal anti inflammatory for pain like Motrin, Advil, Aleve, something like that, that destroys the building block of cartilage? 
and damages the kidneys and interrupts the healing process that's inflammation? Or how about, gee, I don't know, turmeric? Anybody like Indian food? Okay, good. I do. I married a Pakistani girl. It, we eat turmeric all the time. It's a good anti-inflammatory. It helps the joints. It's a good idea. So, so when you look at this, even autonomic, um, this, autonomic dysfunction is the motor of chronic critical illness. So when we have 60% of America's population have a chronic critical illness, okay, of some unknown origin according to the CDC, and we know that this article is saying autonomic dysfunction. I say autonomic adaptation. So does that mean that that chronic critical illness is really an intelligent adaptive physiologic response and we're medicating stress responses instead of fixing the stress and our population is getting sicker? Wow. Mind blown. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at how the body works more. Okay. Um, what's the mnemonic they taught you for the phrenic nerve? Doctor. Keeps you, alive. you got it, baby. C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive. So if you're wondering, gee, I got this big, flat, wide muscle down here called the diaphragm. Okay, and every time I breathe in, that that function of the diaphragm is actually a nerve coming out of my neck. So does that mean that if I have a neck problem, the diaphragm might not be working correctly? Wow. Or what about like hiatal hernias? Like you got the flat muscle, you got the esophagus going through it. Now, if you compromise the integrity of that muscle, could the fundus of that stomach um, come in into that cavity and cause reflux or hiatal hernia? Absolutely, that's what we see all the time. Now also, autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic loop, uh, so this is bronchial constriction, dilation, the smooth muscle inside of the lungs are all are operated by the autonomic nervous system. So does that mean that anything that can negatively affect or put that person in a stressed state can cause asthma, allergies, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? I mean, we're talking, we're talking abnormal lung function. Does that make sense? So why is that on the CDC list? Could there be some things that are stressing people out? Possibly. So when we look at this, the respiratory system is amazing. And in fact, do me a favor, take a deep breath in. Now exhale all the way out. Whoa, look at all the acid come out. Okay, carbon dioxide is an acid. So you just alkalinized your system. Now, if you're really, really cool, you breathe in through the nose, which increases nitric oxide and helps also bronchodilate. So you actually got more oxygen if you're breathing in through the nose. So does that mean that diseases, particularly cancer, that grows in an acidic medium just by deep breathing, you're getting healthier? What a trip. Okay, knowing that you have respiration, perspiration, pooping, and peeping, okay, and these are all the ways that the body alkalinizes and detoxes. If you increase respiration, does that take some stress off of the kidneys and everything else? It really does. So now let's look at this. You got these little clusters of grape sacs called alveoli, and they open and close, open and close all the time. So they have this lubricant that looks kind of like WD-40. It's not. It's called surfactant. But if you have a healthy immune system response, you're going to produce surfactant. If you're producing not much or, or you're dehydrated, your body's got to protect the alveoli. So it's going to produce mucus. Now, mucus is a bummer because it's really thick and it's hard to get that carbon dioxide and oxygen transfer through that wall. Um, so this is why, you know, just got a seven-year-old kid in with asthma and, and, you know, her family's all around. And I says, okay, you're not drinking enough water. Make sure you're drinking water. And her mom goes over and slaps her and says, see, I told you. And I said, no, I told you. She's doing three steroids. Okay, do you think her body is fully hydrated or in deep shit trouble? Okay, deep trouble. Because these steroids are putting her in a stress state and she's already in a stress state because she has these asthma attacks and can't breathe correctly. So if we're looking at lung function, should we look at the neck? Go on, stay with me, duh. 
Okay, because that's a nerve to the diaphragm. What about the cardiac and respiratory center, knowing that the parasympathetic nervous system actually innervates that? Okay, should we look at a problem up there? Absolutely. Okay, so when we look at viruses are beneficial for asthma. What? Wait a second. Repeated viral infections other than the low respiratory tract early in life may reduce the risk of developing asthma. Think of this. Now, I saw this one talk, and it was brilliant. It talked about how since the 1960s, we've been sending men in, in low Earth orbit in space, and they're staying up there longer and longer. And we're starting to find out that these diseases that we were never exposed to because we have this stress of gravity and air, okay, that our bodies are designed to have this stress. And if we get into an area where we don't have this stress, our body breaks down. This means certain stressors are really, really good for you. Now, we're seeing 54% of our kids have a chronic critical illness that they'll never recover from. So think of this. Knowing that the stress of viral infections helps with asthma. And we have an epidemic of asthma. Could we require certain childhood diseases in order to strengthen our immune system? When we talked in depth about the measles vaccine, it turns out that if you actually catch wild measles, you're protected from certain cancers. Isn't that interesting? So think of it. These childhood illnesses, things that, that when, when I was a kid, Oh, you got measles? Come on over. Okay, I got a whole bunch of kids that don't have it. Okay, let's give it. Chicken pox? Party on. Come on to my house. I got a shitload of kids. I found out I infected the family up the block from me, from my sister, my older younger sister. <laughs> it, if you have sisters in my age group, you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> okay, so... Antibiotic use and deficiency uh, in infancy may be increased risk of developing asthma. Why would that be? Well, we're talking 80% of our gut, or in the immune system, 80% of our immune system is from the gut. And if you're taking a poisonous mold or an antibiotic that can blow holes in the intestinal tract and wipe out the normal gut flora. So that makes sense. Okay, there's an association between antibiotic use in the first year of life and symptoms. So what do you think I asked the parents of the seven-year-old kid? Did she have ear infections as a kid? You know what you typically get? Ah, oh, no, 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 just like two or three. <laughs> two or three. So that means that there was probably a traumatic birth indi indicating that the nerve to the soft palate was damaged, and then she was probably treated with antibiotics. Is she fully vaccinated or no shots? At seven years old, you're looking at around 50 vaccines inside of that child, actually 54, okay, by seven years old. And that's, that's a whole different world. Antihistamines linked to Alzheimer's. Antihistamines, so Excedrin, Tylenol, PM, Sominex, Unist, Benadryl. Now, why are these antihistamines negatively affecting the brain? Because we need histamines for the immune system response. Tylenol or acetaminophen it actually breaks that blood-brain barrier and depletes the body of glutathione, the one substance that protects the brain. So that makes sense. Um, you're gonna, it's hard to find a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study. Why? Because nobody wants to talk about this, but this was a really cool study. Allergies um, in the vaccinated, 36%, unvaccinated, 11%. So that's about a threefold increase. Is a 300% increased risk of allergies important? Yeah, this is a lifetime thing. It means your immune system is totally screwed up that it's reacting differently to our environment than it should. So for goodness sake, don't open that bag of peanuts on a plane because someone could stroke out or go into an anaphylactic shock. Have you ever heard of a species that fragile? No. When I was a kid, you could order peanuts at a ball game. Now they have peanut-free days. This is, and when you look at all of the expert sites, okay, you know, the ones that the angels sing at, okay, and what do they say about asthma, or allergies? They say, yes, it's on the rise, but we don't know. It can't be vaccines because we're not going to look into it. Okay, um, asthma, 14% uh, vaccinated, 2% of the unvaccinated. So what is that, a sevenfold increase? Hay fever, 17% uh, versus 3%. 
Okay, so that's a five-fold increase. Uh, neurodermatitis, an autoimmune disorder, 23% of the vaccinated, 7% of the unvaccinated. I mean, you know, we're, when we're seeing our population get sicker, and I, I like this comment, when doctors cannot predict who will be harmed by a vaccine and cannot guarantee that those that have been vaccinated won't get infected or transmit the infection, the ethical principle of informed consent becomes a civil, human, and parental right that must be safeguarded in U.S. law. Non-medical vaccine exemptions um, immunized individuals and the community against unsafe, ineffective vaccines and tyranny. So the one exemption that the CDC has is that if you've had a negative response from that vaccine. Anyone know what the number one sign of a heart attack is? Don't answer, Doc. Don't answer, Doc. Okay, what's the number one sign of a heart attack? Yes. Death. Death. You're right. <laughs> <clears throat> and I know you're, you're thinking, well, two people recovered, one had help. No. <laughs> That's bad. So this is like the witches thing, you know, where you drown them. If they drown, okay, they were, and they die, then they're okay. They were never a witch. If they live, then we burn them at a stake. Okay, so you don't. There's no test out there. And so then you take away the rights of you to choose that, that that's, that's, that's crazy. Now, one of the reasons you're not getting doctors to look at mechanical distortions of the spine that can negatively affect autonomic function or all of this is because they're not taught that this could be corrected. Heck, they're not even taught to even look for this. Okay, because if you find the generation forward head carriage reversal of the curve, and you know that this could be a contributing factor in the acidity of the person or altered lung function or the reflux or the carpal tunnel syndrome or the, the, the golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, all of which are double crush injuries beginning in the neck. If you don't know how to identify and correct this, you're not going to teach people, okay, that this was a contributing factor. Does that make sense? So when we get something like this, a reverse curve in the neck, massive spinal distortions, leaky gut, and they come in and they're diagnosed with high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, anxiety, fatigue, sleep problems, low thyroid, low adrenals, inflammatory bowel disease, fibromyalgia, and chronic regional pain syndrome. Does anybody think they have this? Or is this an intelligent response based on chronic stress? Because do you want to give them the pain reliever, the muscle relaxant, the anti-inflammatory, um, the, the, uh, the sleep medication, the antidepressant, okay? And when you look at it, what do drugs do? All the drugs do, when you look at it, what's the side effect of an antidepressant? Suicide and suicidal thoughts. What's the antidepressant, or what's, what's the side effect of a muscle relaxant, muscle spasms? What's the side effect of opioids? Aside from addiction, it's increased pain after five days of use. So these medications cause the symptom they're designed to treat. Or you look at the mechanical discussion, the, the you know, distortion, and you fix the physical, chemical, and emotional stress load. You know, I asked a doctor earlier, what number should blood pressure be? And he said, spout it out, 120 over 80. Now, I don't think he did any research on this. I don't think he looked at, at around the world to see if they were doing it, but it was probably what he was taught. So when I talk to doctors, okay, and they're under this delusion that this was chiseled in stone. In fact, on the 11th commandment, Moses came down and said, Thou blood pressure shall be 120 millimeters of mercury over 80 millimeters of mercury. <laughs> okay, I know. Now, that was in the lost Ark of the Covenant, so we forgot that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so let's look at how crazy is perpetuated. Okay, Joint National Committee met in 1994, a group of, you know, doctors and their own hospitals and political lobbyists and, or pharmaceutical lobbyists, and they said, we think it should be 120 over 80. Okay, high blood pressure is going to be 140 over 90. Okay, now, in 2004, Joint National Committee 7 said, no, 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 that'll never do. It should be 115 over 75. Okay, and in fact, we're going to make it sound really official so that, in fact, um, the coronary or cardiac vascular disease, okay, so we're talking heart disease, doubles 
with each increment of 20 over 10. God, that sounds right. So now prehypertensive used to be old normal. Now this worked out pretty good, except a lot of people, since you know what the article that we just read, if you take a blood pressure medication, your risk of stroke increases, and you're lowering blood pressure to such an extreme level, do you think there were a lot of strokes, perhaps mental confusions, little balance and falls issues? Okay, yeah, probably. So 2014 met, Joint National Committee says, no, we have new normals. We have new science-based guidelines. And I'm going, I thought it was based in science before. This is what I'm telling all my patients, that you guys are the smartest mofos on the planet, okay, that you actually study this. You're not just there rolling the dice. I don't know, man. I think that looks good. I don't know. <laughs> Let's roll it again. Okay, you know, this is crazy. It's crazy. Okay, so now if you're over 60, so I got one more, more I got uh, actually five more months left and I'm over 60. Yeah, baby. So I can have my blood pressure at 150 over 90. Okay, right now it's got to be 140 over 90. Okay, <laughs> seriously. Okay, but don't buy yet, folks, because that was 2014. So 2017 rolls around, American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association say, you know, we just, just, I just, I just don't like it. Okay. I think 130 over 80 would be better. Okay. And they even say current evidence doesn't support an absolute threshold for initiating treatment, whether it's 130 over 80 or 140 over 90. We just like it. Okay. And this is, so it depends. So when people say, you know, doc, how do I get my blood pressure down? And I look them straight in the eye and I say, well, what number are you going for? <laughs> okay, and they look at me like I've lost my mind. And I said, well, you know, you're checking it. You might want a number. Okay, you pick it. Okay, and this isn't universal. America's not the only stupid one. Okay, I mean, all the countries have different levels as well. So what if, what if you had blood that's supposed to look like big old huge red blood cells? But if you're under chronic stress, you're producing less stomach acid, so you can't break the proteins to amino acids. So then the blood cells get sticky. So instead of having these beautiful biconcave discs floating around that can hold oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients, and then now they start to get sticky and clumped together, so you look like little worms like that. Do you think that holds good amounts of oxygen or poor amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide? Very poor. So if you got that horrible looking blood there, what do you think has to happen to pressure to adapt to that physiologic trauma or that chronic stressor. Do you think blood pressure would have to go up to maintain the integrity of your physiology? Duh. Okay. So, and I, I changed this guy's name. His name does, first name does start with an R, um, but he's one of the patients down in Mexico. This was his blood on the left, okay, when he came down. And that's bad. Okay, that's not what it should look like. Now, we're adjusting them three times a day down there, but when, because we're only open two and a half days a week down there, but he was down there for five days. He did three de detoxing. He did vitamin IVs because you can clean up the blood. In fact, your blood is only 120 days old. That means every 120 days, you got 6 million brand new red blood cells. I mean, so your body is always healing, always regenerating. So that was his blood cells afterwards. And I said, this is cool. Okay, now clogged arteries. Okay, can you reverse it? Absolutely, because again, it's a living structure. Soluble fibers literally clean the arteries. Antioxidants, I mean, um, prevent cancer, heart disease, other illnesses. Wait a second. Cancer and heart disease, wasn't that Two of the six ones that 60% of our population has? Could it be that simple that we go to a plant-based diet that's organic with antioxidants that can actually start cleaning the arteries? Uh, flavonoids appear to reduce oxidation of low-density lipoprotein. High broccoli consumption is associated with significant reductions in heart attack risk. It can't be that simple. Shana, find out if there's a patent on broccoli. For God's sake, let's invest in that. <laughs> Okay, so, so we're looking at this. Just one extra serving lowers heart disease risk. Okay, obviously, but think of this. The entire medical system 
if they if you go in there to the doctor and you say doc i'm having a lot of stress and my blood pressure is high they have no payment ability okay that they, they, they can say look you need to eat fresh fruit you need to drink some water okay you need to get off of these medications because your risk of stroke is increasing how are you sleeping correctly in fact i'm going to write a prescription i'm going to send you over to this chiropractor to get your structure checked okay and they also have an autonomic nervous system function so here take this script over to the chiropractor and we're going to get you healthy there's nothing like that in place because that's outcome oriented and if you're responsible because my docs here are responsible for the outcome because at 30 adjustments by god you're going to be shooting a post x-ray if that person is not having a normal physiology by then or showing appropriate structural changes it's our fault so we are outcome oriented and that's what all the doctors should be does that make sense your car mechanic is the outcome oriented Gee, I've had your car for three weeks and you spent $30,000 and it still isn't working like shit, but you know, here, you can give me, you know. No, we have to have outcome based care, okay, where the physician is responsible for your outcomes. Now, let's look at the digestive tract. Think of this you smell food, so digestion begins in the brain. You smell food, your stomach produces an acid. So, like if you smell, and Pavlov did great studies on this where they cut openings in dogs' stomachs. They smell chicken, different acid. Lamb, different acid. So, I mean, it's amazing. So, you start smelling it up here. And the food, you chew it up here. Carbohydrate digestion begins here. Then it goes down into the stomach. Then there's a muscle on top of the stomach that closes it off to slosh around the acid in there to break down the proteins to amino acids. Then it goes right after the stomach into the C-shaped thing called the duodenum, where the gallbladder is going to sense fats in there and then it has this gallbladder that contracts to um, let loose bile, okay, through the same opening that the pancreas goes through. And then this emulsifies fats. Then the pancreas secretes some pancreatic enzymes and some bicarb to alkalinize that food coming out of that really acidic stomach so that as it goes through the intestinal tract, it starts to have those nutrients absorbed through this portal system. And then everything goes through the wall of the intestinal tract into the liver, which is a giant enzyme factory that coalesces the sugar, the, the carbohydrates that are broken down to usable sugars, the proteins that are broken down to amino acids, and the fats that are broken down to fatty acids so your body can rebuild its whole system all the time. So that's how the system works. And then all of that, the undigested food gets dumped in the intestinal tract, and this is where the bacteria start to eat it. You've got bacteria, funguses, yeast, parasites, everything in that. And it's supposed to be, it's an ecosystem. And that's where 80% of the immune system is. So you might think, wow, anything that damages that bacteria or intestinal tract, okay, could damage you and you would be correct. So this is why when you take antibiotics, we saw that it increases your risk of lung problems, but it also increases your risk of cancer rate. So what about antibiotics that are sprayed on the food like glyphosates? Okay, that also damages the intestinal tract. So when you look at this, the stomach just by itself is amazing. And you might think, if this can break down bone, okay, um, you've, got, you've, got, um, you've got these cells, okay, one of them, hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid can burn through any cell you've got. So how does the cell that you have make hydrochloric acid? Anyone? Anyone? Do you remember this, Doc? Doc? Okay, okay, I gotta tell you guys this, because this is really cool. I mean, it's just, it's way beyond an intelligent design. You got a chloride ion in one, you got a hydrogen in the other, and so it spits it out and it forms outside of the cell. Go ahead, stay with me. Wow. I know, that just happened like random chance. I don't think it was an intelligent design. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, that's an intelligent design. <laughs> How do you make acid so strong that it'll burn up bone but won't burn up the cell? So now this acid is inside of there, and then pepsin is even worse than hydrochloric acid. But you've got these goblet cells that are continually lining the intestinal or the, the stomach with this mucus. So the acid burns up that, and, and it still makes you healthy. Okay, so your stomach can digest food for 120, 130 years. Okay, so that's cool, so it works.
So when we look at this, um, and this, the proton pump inhibitors are amazing because it allows you to eat poisonous food. Um, but what happens is when we look at, let's go back to the stomach, there's a muscle on top of the stomach that closes off the esophagus. And that muscle is initiated or tightens up on presence of acid in the stomach. So if you decrease the acid in the stomach, that lowers the tone of that muscle. So when the body is sloshing around this to break it down, the, the acidity can slosh up into the esophagus. So what does that mean? That means proton pump inhibitors increase adenocarcinomas. Okay, it also decreases acids, so this decreases minerals. So this is actually very, very dangerous. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, my doctor said that my constant reflux was going to increase my risk of cancer, so they gave me a little purple pill for 24 hours of relief. Well, he needs to look at the British Journal of Cancer, and this is 10 years ago, so it's, it's brand new information. <laughs> okay. Or he could tell you to don't drink water half hour before a meal, during a meal, or a half hour after. Why? Because you need acid in the stomach in order to get it to work correctly. And, you know, when we talk about gastrointestinal talk, we talk about, you know, bentane hydrochloric acid that you could take. But, you know, you really, it's healthy stomach function. If you have physical, chemical, or emotional stress, you have that imbalance of the autonomic nervous system. Does blood supply to the gut increase or decrease under stress? Decreases. Yeah, so you're looking at a chronic stressor. H. pylori. And in fact, uh, it can be found in half the world's population. Okay. I've seen up to 90% that it's found in the world's population. So, but they'll still blame helicopylorus as being the cause of stomach ulcers. Is it really when it's found in between 50 and 90% of the population? Or could it be a chronic stressor that's decreasing um, the body's natural ability to have normal functioning tissue? What do you think? Okay, so what are the causes of gut damage? Altered nervous system, antibiotics, genetically modified vaccines, and processed foods. Let's look at cholesterol. Your body produces 80% of the overall cholesterol. Cholesterol is 50% of the overall weight of your brain. It's the precursor to every glucocorticosteroid, mineral corticosteroid, or sex hormone. It's absolutely vital. Cholesterol does not clog arteries. Cholesterol does not clog arteries. Cholesterol does not clog arteries. You know, I say that because afterwards someone will say, Doc, my arteries, my, cl my, my cholesterol is high. What can I take to lower it? You don't need to lower it. It's raised based on your need. Okay, so you got systemic inflammation or you got some high stress. So that's what cholesterol is. Now, if you give a drug to lower cholesterol, they're called statins. Okay, in fact, the Lipitor was the first drug to cross the $10 billion mark. So if you have no ethics or morals and want to invest in pharmacy, this is a great investment. Problem is, um, it causes atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries and heart failure. Okay, thus the epidemic of heart failure and atherosclerotic plaques that plague the modern world may be paradoxically be aggravated by the pervasive use of statin drugs. We propose that the current statin treatment guidelines be critically reevaluated. Why? Okay, we're looking at clinical cardiology, 2009, statin therapy associated with decreased myocardial in in, in function. So this is bad heart muscle function. Increased prevalence of coronary plaquing possessing calcium. Now that was in 2012. Cholesterol is vital for brain function. So does this mean that now that we have a one-in-one -one ratio of brain damage in our population, hopefully that you know, we'll be able to avoid that if you change it? But this is outrageous. Okay, outrageous. Now, intestinal permeability. This is what's called leaky gut. And, and people will say, well, you're mentioning something that has never been proven. Well, okay, let's call it intestinal permeability. Okay, okay. It just means that the, the, that, that tube, that muscular tube, the intestinal tract that is mu uh, muscle, you know, a tissue lining that has this peristaltic wave, that there's a, a decreased blood supply or nerve supply to it, or there's some type of toxin, because anything you put in there gets into that intestinal tract. If you have chronic stress, you have decreased blood supply and nerve supply to it. Does that make sense? So this increased intestinal permeability correlates 
um, with early Parkinson's, okay, or endotoxin exposure. So what kind of things damage the intestinal tract? We know that glyphosates do. We know that vaccines do. We know that medications do. We know that toxic processed foods can damage the intestinal tract. Is that why we have so many damaged, um, or Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia? And I could have brought up Lou Gehrig's here, all that stuff. It has to do with the intestinal lining. This is a patient that was diagnosed with autoimmune disorder based on the adjuvants, because in our society today, you cannot disrespect vaccines, but you can disrespect the additives in the vaccine that stimulate the immune system that can cause this. That's the leaky gut on the left, and that's a normal gut on the right. So what do you do? You heal the gut. How do you heal the gut? You deal with the physical, chemical, and emotional stressor. Okay, stop injecting the neurotoxins. The current schedule, Okay, 72 doses of 17 different vaccines by the time they're 18 years old. Now, this is a really interesting experiment because when, the, when they passed the no liability law in 1986, the companies were starting to go out of business because of so many lawsuits. So you could make the, the vaccine safer um, or limit its usage or take away any liability, product liability, and quadruple the number of vaccines. Okay, well, it's actually, they didn't quadruple it. They septupled it. Okay, say that three times really fast. So we went from about 12 to 72. Okay, now the adult vaccine schedule's coming. Okay, that'll be 2021, and there'll be 15 forced adult vaccines. So we just need to take a stand on this. Now, sensitization to bovine serum albumin has possible cause of allergic reaction to vaccines. As the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine is probably due uh, to sensitization for the porcine gelatin. So again, when you're injecting a foreign protein into the body, the body looks at foreign proteins as bad. So they're gonna mount an immune system defense to it. So this is why when we have continual foreign proteins injected into the population, we see a massive rise in allergies, asthma, autoimmune conditions, inflammatory brain problems, encephalitis, all of these things because the body is getting things that are in there that it can't really recognize and tries to fight. The next um, few years are gonna be exciting. There's over 271 vaccines in development. And be, the reason that we're seeing that your religious rights um, or religious exemptions have been taken away, your personal beliefs exemptions have been taken away. If you have a medical doctor that's thinking and does research, his opinion is now taken away. So now it's completely by the state, okay, in California. And the way California goes, so shall all other states. So you can't really move from here. It's just, you know, part of your world now. The only thing that we can do is watch our, our video on, on um, conscientious uh, or informed consent and civil disobedience because we really have to just say no. Um, now, the reproductive system. Remember, we're going back to the nervous system again. Here's the mnemonic. S234 keeps the ding-dong off the floor. So what do you think innervates the pelvic floor? So when we see people with bowel or bladder dysfunction, you see people walking where their pelvis is really wide, okay? You can say, wow, you got bowel or bladder dysfunction. So that is, it could be a dysfunction of the pelvis. I mean, literally altering the nerves to the pelvic floor. I mean, I'm seeing commercials where people are saying, yes, you know, I love this new diaper. Now I can go to yoga class and I feel better. There's no embarrassing leakage. <laughs> Dude, you're only 60, okay? You know, fix the problem, okay? And the problem isn't lack of diapers, okay? You know... We've got this structure here that works good, okay? Your great-grandparents never had to wear diapers, okay? They never had endometriosis. They never had polycystic ovary syndrome, okay? They had, I know they were whacked because your great-grandparents only ate organic and they walked everywhere, okay? And they didn't have a lot of EMFs and they didn't take a lot of medications. I know, I know. But, you know, let's go back to that lifestyle and see if we're healthy. The prostate issues, if you can see where the prostate is, it's at the floor. If you have pelvic instability, that prostate is not going to work better or it's not going to work healthy. 
And when you're talking pesticides, or a lot of them are estrogen based, and you're looking at the endocrine disruptors located in our processed foods, that's all going to negatively affect the male and female reproductive. And when you look at this, this is the ultimate. We've got the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. How do we describe this to students so they will never forget it? Point and shoot. Parasympathetic for the arousal, shoot is the sympathetic. Do you remember that from school? Docs? Okay, good. Did you guys still use it? In, yeah, okay, yeah. I know, I love mnemonics. <laughs> so this is it. How your body works. Look at the physical, chemical, or emotional stress. There's ways to deal with all three of these, and there's only three. And you can work it. The physical stress, you got to look at your biomechanics and look at the structure. Chemical stress, you can oral chelate, IV chelate. You know, there's a lot of different ways your body can detox. I mean, not toxifying the body would be one thing, but you know, since we're living in this environment, detoxing would be nice. And emotional, you can actually reach retrain your brain. Eye movement desensitization response (NLP). But let's look at this. I mean, when we're looking. All of those chronic diseases that the CDC doesn't know why they're there. If you add, okay, plant-based foods, and we're talking organic, nearly every fruit and vegetable contains NFKB inhibitors. This means that they will be effective against cancer, hardening of the arteries, myocardial infarction, diabetes, allergies, asthma, arthritis, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, psoriasis, septic, shock, and AIDS. And this is fruits and vegetables. It can't be that simple. Organic plant-based diet, fermented fats, um, or fermented vegetables, juice, ble vegetables, blended fruits, raw dairy. I mean, you, can you see why we put this up? Okay, to maintain your healthy body, you're not going to deal with symptoms. That's crazy. The symptoms is your body adapting to the environment. Okay, so that in, in adaptation is always intelligent. You have to look at the structure, the physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. This is why you look at the nervous system. To maintain a healthy body, you gotta exercise every day. Proper nutrition, it means if man makes it, you don't eat it. Sufficient sleep and prayer and meditation. Does that make sense? It's almost too easy. So, I mean, you can go to Extreme Health Academy. I mean, just get on there. You get a two week, uh, you know, for, for no charge, Bergman 14. But look at other, I mean, get together in groups. This is one group. You don't need to go here. Okay. It's just one group. I mean, Justin and Kate are cool and their kids are just darling. Okay. The Puerto Vallarta, this is coming up in a couple of weeks, which is going to be really cool. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's like one or two things left, but if not, it's just going to be fun. I'll try and film it and bring it and, or put it online or something. And the cruise in April next year. Okay. Now, any questions? Good. Okay. So next. Oh, yes, sir. And I've got to repeat the question. Where are you going in October? Uh, you oh, <laughs> where am I going in October? It's for, this is kind of fun. It's, it's the Wealth Cruise. It's done by um, Dr. McPhee. Um, I, for, I forget the name of it. it it's, um, it's, I mean, he's been a speaker on so many of our cruises. And so I'm speaking on his cruise. So oh. I know, I don't have to set it up. I'm only speaking six hours over seven days, which man, I could do that stand on my left ear. So this is like, this is like my first vacation. And since I've been working seven days a week for the last six months, um, I'm really teaching on a cruise. Yes. No, I'm working six hours for seven days. I'm going to have a freaking ball. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we close with point second. Um, no, I think the office, I don't know. Um, I mean, the lecture. Oh, I don't know. Are we close the 22nd? I don't know. <laughs> I'll find out. I'll find out. I haven't looked at the schedule yet either. I think I'm, I think I'm teaching next week for sure, and I think the week after we're going to be dark for that Tuesday, unless I can find one of the docs that, that want to learn how to teach. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Any recommendation for getting off high blood pressure pills? The recommendation for getting off of high blood pressure pills is look at the physical, chemical, emotional stress and take it correctly. Now, how do you check your blood pressure correctly? 
Um, do you want to check it when you're doing four shots of espresso and running upstairs? Do you want to check it when you're bike riding up a hill? Why? Because it's going to go up. Not straight, because, oh, so what you're telling me is that blood pressure goes up and down based on your need. Oh, that makes sense. So I guess if you want to check it at your baseline, you should take 10 minutes of deep breathing diaphragmatically with your arm level with your heart and then check it. God, that makes sense. So then you get it. Diaphragmatic breathing means you breathe in, tummy goes out, breathe out, goes in. So that diaphragmatic breathing for 10 minutes is a good one. And when you look at some of the medical references, they say it's virtually impossible to get an accurate reading in an office because talking, a cold room, full bladder, white coat hypertension, it's almost impossible to get a good reading. So at home, deep breathe, your arm level resting, okay, 10 minutes, then you check it. Then you call up the doctor that gave it. You tell him not that, gee, I was in a sympathetic dominant state. I had a lot of physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. I was sleeping like crap, and I had one poop every other day. Now I've got two bowel movements every day, and my autonomic system is functioning in more harmony. Okay? No, don't tell him that. Okay, just say, I made some lifestyle changes, doc, and this is my blood pressure reading. Okay, and if you're taking multiple, they'll get you off the diuretic first because that's going to really wipe out your heart. And that's why they got to give you an MK or omega potassium because it's really depleting your body of minerals. Then they'll get you out the beta blocker next because that's actually blocking the sympathetic nerves to the heart. That's really bad. Okay, then they'll get you out the ACE inhibitor next or the calcium channel blocker. So, so this way you get, get off, of, off of all of them. And you'll find out that the blood pressure is still normal. Okay, even when you stop them, you know, but just the doctor in this country that prescribed it has to be the one to get you off. But currently there's no laws that force you to take the medication until it's like 2025 when they come out with the medication trackers. What? <laughs> well, they're developing medication trackers for Alzheimer's patients because they forget stuff and you have to keep taking the medications. Okay, you don't want to forget things that alter your physiology. So, yeah, they're going to change that. Yes, ma'am. Do you go to Mexico? Do I go to Mexico? Yes, I'm going Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week. Yep, and I go pretty much every week unless I'm traveling or teaching. So next week, um, I actually got a really cool talk lined up. Okay, you're going to like it. Thank you very much. Thank you.